Hello, I'm Victor, as Jeremy said. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the great speakers. It's been fantastic, all of you. Um, I want to thank Lennart and Matei and Pedro and all the other ADDC guys who have put this together and for inviting me year after year after year. I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to talk about remote working. Um, um, and I, I guess that's a topic that is getting more and more common. Um, but there's not much information out there, and the information out there is kind of ludicrous most of the time. Anyway, I tell my clients most often that uh, they need to be honest about who they are and what they are as a company to their customers. So I thought I'd start with talking a little bit about myself and a little bit what I do, and then some stuff about remote working, uh, what works, what doesn't work, uh, and kind of like just what I learned over the last year. And hopefully it can be useful to some of you, but I will guess we'll see. Uh, I'm from Stockholm, Sweden. And this picture probably has popped up in your Facebook feed together with some sort of, you know, utopian article about how amazing the city is with like three rainbows and, you know, stuff like that. But most of the time, Stockholm is more like this, you know? <laughs> Uh, also, I, th I thought I had a really funny joke now because of the World Cup, how it usually looks like when we play football as a country, you know? Um, but <laughs> but so for some, some reason, this year it looks more like this. Uh, I know, it's great. Yeah, big applause to our kind of very mediocre national team. <laughs> um, uh, and this was like, I had five different slides depending on the outcome, but I guess we'll see tomorrow. Uh, anyway. <laughs> and uh, despite what you might think, when you, if you watch one of our games, not all Swedish people are blonde and tall. We have many different nationalities that we all welcome as Swedes. Uh, anyway, I went to school here, uh, right there. Uh, it's a school called Billy Blue School of Graphic Arts. And uh, did I say it was in Sydney? It's in Sydney. If you haven't been, you should go. It's a lovely place. Uh, I was there for a couple of years, and then I went back to Stockholm, and I went to school there. Uh, it's called Berg School of Communication. Went there for another year, uh, and then I got a job here. Uh, actually, this is my second job. The first job I ever got, well, I got fired from, so technically it's the second job. But, uh, and then after a couple of years, I got recruited for, uh, to a startup right there in that window. Uh, I never actually sat there. Uh, you maybe see that the sign there, it says Google. Yes, this building is now owned by Google because they kind of just take over the whole of Mountain View. Uh, and also, um, after just three months, uh, they got acquired by Google. So I basically moved to California and started working for Google. And I was there for about seven years. Um, and I was the lead designer for products like Google Maps. We started with the one first application we actually built ourselves on iOS and then a few iterations on Android and on desktop and stuff. I was also one of the lead designers on uh, material design, um, which was really fun. And I stayed at that team for four years. During that time, we also managed to uh, rebrand Google, which was also really fun. Uh, anyway, last year, roughly at the same time as the conference last year, I decided to leave Google because um, I wanted to see what the world had to offer kind of outside the comfortable nap pods and the excellent free food options, much like you know the, the restaurants around here, but inside of Google. Uh, I decided to risk it all, leave my job, uh, leave the safety of my job, and uh, start my own design studio. And now, one year later, I work with clients all over the world, such as Google. <laughs> yeah, quite the change. <laughs> uh, no, but of course, it's a privilege to have Google as a client, of course. Uh, and while this is true, I've also been fortunate to work with a lot of other companies, too. Um, I'm also a co-founder of a little startup in New York, uh, and it's super early days, very secret. Hopefully, I can share more next year if I'm invited back after this presentation. Who knows? Um, anyway. So the studio I've, I've started is called Graphic. Uh, we're based in New York most of the time, even though we all work remotely. It's me and my uh, 
partner who is an industrial design uh, person, I suppose, designer. <laughs> uh, he's now, he lives in Milan now, so we're all over the place. Um, and almost all our clients are in different cities than we are. Um, and sometimes I hire uh, contractors as a team, and they're usually also remote. So it's all over the place. Hello. Anyway, I decided to start my own studio because I wanted to be my own boss. And this is not my calendar, but it's kind of just reflect how crazy it can get when you work at a large corporation. And I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to gain more everyday uh, freedom because I realized after a while how much time I spent at work getting to and from work. You know, the commute in California is just horrible. And um, I was working weekends and all kinds of stuff, mostly because I thought it was like worth it, but also it was always for someone else's agenda. And after a while, it just didn't make sense to me. So I decided to try and do something about this. I realized that I was probably never going to be rich enough to just stop working and just like work on fun stuff. Uh, so I tried to create a reality where I can work on my own terms for, uh, for myself with things that I liked, at least most of the time. So I started my own company, but I did very little research. I was kind of inspired by the, the whole world of remote is the future articles. Then they kind of live in this promised land between beach houses and tree houses. Uh, it was super convincing, so I tried to do just that, and I worked from here, 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 and uh, a lot of other places like this. And I mean, to be, to I say work, but totally honest, I really didn't work much when I was there. I mean, I worked a little bit, but you know, so you know, cell phone reception and, and Wi-Fi is not that great everywhere. So it's really it's harder than you think. They sell you on this image, but it's much harder, and you never actually do it. And also, no matter how much I tried to do this, it only added up to like about eight weeks a year. The rest of the 46 weeks, I worked probably from a place like this, probably wearing this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Jokes aside, though, my everyday life did improve a lot. Just removing this guy and, the, and you know, the, 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 the commute gave me about two more hours every day. And that's a lot of time. That's almost a month a year that I could spend on other things. So I had all kinds of ideas of what I should do with all this newfound time. And I was, one thing was that I was going to get really fit for 2018. And yeah, it didn't really happen. And then <laughs> I was going to have like super long, nice, stress-free breakfast with my girlfriend in bed every day. And yeah, maybe we did that once or twice, but it didn't really happen either. Um, I totally fell for this guy again with the utopian ideas of you know, who I'd want to become and who I'd want to be. Um, I did some of these things, but I never really enjoyed it as much as I hoped, mostly because there were so many things that I didn't account for. And for me, it became sort of a paradox, because I wanted a flexible work schedule, work on my own terms, free to choose where and from when. But I didn't realize that having a permanent office, team members, regular meetings, and all that stuff wasn't all bad. It becomes, problem that you have, it becomes problems that you have to solve for yourself when you're on your own. And this is kind of like my paradox, because all the things that I tried to get away from became the things that I had to solve for myself. And now I didn't have the structure of a team, or I didn't have the structure of a workplace that was already there. So I ended up spending more time doing the things that I tried to escape from when I was on my own. Anyway, I bet some of you, or many of you, have thought about maybe starting your own business, becoming a freelancer. Uh, maybe a few of you already have. Maybe you just want to work remotely on Fridays. I don't know. Um, and when I, when I got asked to come back here this year, I thought that I'll just share a few things that I've learned. Uh, so today I have eight things that you can think about. And these points are not necessarily specific to designers and engineers, but as Jeremy said, like, our industry lends itself so well to remote working, and we are kind of the first ones to adapt this kind of new, more flexible view of looking at uh, an office. So here we go. I'm going to get some water before we start. 
anyway, worry about overworking and not underworking. And really, and this is true for when you start your own business or if you're just a remote worker, or if you have a team of remote people. Um, but when you start your own business, really the only thing you worry about uh, when you start out is like, am I going to be able to buy food next month? Am I, <laughs> am I going to keep afloat? And you worry about your rent, your bills, and your costs, and all that stuff. And the, honestly, there's not much you can do about that. It's just the reality of, of, of the world, right? You can have money to live. And you end up worrying so much about this that you end up overcompensating once you turn the page and you start to get clients. So you overcompensate so much, that, you know, that you don't say, you say yes to pretty much every project and you start doing like work out a little bit too hard and you end up overworking a lot. <laughs> so I definitely made this mistake. Um, earlier this year, I had to pay my taxes as a company for the first time. And either I have a terrible accountant or I'm just stupid, I don't know. But they were way higher than I thought. So I was, I was left with about $500, one low paying client in like a very short term con uh, contract. And naturally, I freaked the fuck out, you know. Um, so I called everyone I knew. I emailed everyone and begged for work. And so what I did was I overcompensated because of the fear of failing. And when you ask everyone you know for work, you add so many prospective clients at once, you don't know which one you're going to get, so you can't say no to any of them. And what happened is that I ended up with so much work that, you know, <laughs> I worked 120 hour weeks for, for, for three or four months with five big projects all at once. Three of them which I really didn't want to do. <laughs> you know? So th this is a real problem. And learning how to not overwork is really important because you'll burn out really, really quickly. If you're, if you're not, not self-employed or maybe you manage a team of remote workers, you also worry about underworking a lot, or we tend to do that. If you plan to work from home or whatever, you worry about, oh, am I going to be able to like, withstand the, 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 all the distractions of uh, you know, the TV or the Xbox or whatever. However, distractions are everywhere. I think they're at an office too, we just don't think of them as distractions. Most of them are called team members or friends at work. They tend to distract you and, and ask you questions that are not necessary all the time and kind of take you out of your work zone a lot. So I don't think distractions are unique to working remotely. And however, there are some things that you can do about it. I'm going to go through them a little bit later on. If you, um, if you have employees that are from remote and you can't trust them to work where you can't see them, I think you have some micromanagement <laughs> issues you have to work out, you know, or you just hired completely the wrong people. However, there's some processes that you can set up so that maybe y your team can, you know, share more of the same goal and like work together better. Um, okay, so what can you do about this? If you start your own business or if you're a freelancer, uh, you should learn how to Manage your sales pipeline. And that, sounds, that sounded like mumbo jumbo to me. I did, had no idea what that was. But a friend of mine, actually the co-founder of my startup, told me that I should really look into this um, because what it does is it spreads out your projects over time better. And so you should just do some research about this and see what, if it can help you. Come on. OK. Maintain a buffer of cash. I tried to do this. I failed. Uh, but for me, it's about four to five months of expenses. I'm paranoid and neurotic. If you're more relaxed, maybe two months, I don't know. Everyone's different. And if you have done those two things, this should be fairly easy, but really try to just stay calm and carry on. If you worry too much, you're going to overcompensate, and then you're going to work too much. And that just, you know, you can't do that forever. Okay, number two. It's really tied to the last point, which is work-life balance. Uh, learning how to manage your work-life balance is key. Because when you have an office, uh, a lot of this kind of comes for free. It might not be perfect. But 
you know, there's some sort of a structure. You're, you probably go to work roughly around the same time every day and go home roughly around the same time. You kind of follow what your teammates are doing. Anyway, when, it, when you're working from home or wherever you might be, this is completely on you. And it's really hard when the lines between work and private life, uh, and when they're blurred. So the first thing is to learn to say no. I am terrible at this uh, because, I don't know, I, I, I tend to say yes to everything, especially to people that I care about. I don't want to let people down. Um, so I really had to ask myself, like, how much can I work? When does my work, end start, work day start? When does it end? Uh, set the rules and really try to stick to them. Another one of more concrete example of what you can do is create this uh, hardware boundary. So uh, compute differently when you're working and when you're not working. So uh, this is not really a remote working problem. I think a lot of people use their work computer at home these days. But when you only work from home or wherever, this becomes a problem. And some say maybe getting like an iPad or a large uh, tablet to watch Netflix on kind of it helps you not to start working. I've definitely done this a few times where I was late at night trying to find some new Netflix show. And sure enough, two hours later, I worked on some logo type for two hours. And I didn't know why. <laughs> uh, and if you do this every day, like, it adds up. And you work too much. Another one is to try to create a dedicated workspace at home. It's a great way to set boundaries uh, from like, not working from bed, not working from the sofa. You have to work from this dedicated space. Um, and if you don't have the space at home, or, and this is common, a lot of people start to feel lonely um, when you don't hang out with people at work. Uh, anyway, trying to add imaginary coworkers, such as people drinking coffee in cafes, or uh, there are also in ev almost every city, there's coworking spaces these days. Um, I personally don't want to spend money on coworking spaces because I find just paying for coffee is expensive enough. Um, so, but you know, there are a lot of cool people there, and maybe the investment will, will you know, you, you'll get your money back eventually, uh, or you might just meet a lot of interesting people. So, okay. So, really, the main theme is here that you have to create your own routine. That it's some, when you're at work, you have this for free, but now you don't, so you have to create it yourself. And it's really, really hard. It takes time and it's hard. Like habits are not easy to, to, to create. Um, and I didn't think about it. I'm not very good at it. I work at it every day. Um, I'm getting better. OK, number three, and this is mostly for people that go freelance or start their own business. Don't do it only for the money. Um, like I said, when you're starting your business or going freelance, the only thing you worry about is next month. And everyone is kind of prepared for this when you go out and do this. You know that this is going to be hard. What you didn't think about, or what I didn't think about, uh, is that other side of the same coin. So what happens when you turn that page and you get more work that you can handle? Which one do you say no to? Or do you say no at all? Do you start to scale your business? Do you start to hire people? It's really, really hard to say no to money. But once you start to like take on work, solely based on the size of the budget, you're going to guaranteed uh, um, compromise on the quality of your work and your work-life balance. And it's not as easy as it sounds. You know, I've definitely taken on projects just for the money. Uh, and I guess my point here is that you, at least I do, and I think a lot of people mistake need or greed for need, or vice versa. Greed is often mistaken for need, that's right. Um, so you think that you need the money, but you actually don't, and then you take on this project and start to make up all these reasons why you should take this product. Anyway, the one easy way to kind of remove yourself from the equation is to get a little organized again. And the first thing you can do is know your costs. I know, sounds rudimentary, budgeting, right? I've never really created a budget in my entire life. Uh, but now I do. And you don't really have to get really complicated. You can just write down all your expenses, remove the ones that are not necessarily, they're not necessary, we all have them. Um, the sum of this is what you need to earn after tax to keep afloat. Now, every time you have an incoming project, ask yourself these two questions. Would, do you need this to cover my cost? 
do I need this to cover my cost? Will I survive without this, uh, this project? Or, and, would I tell other people about this work? Would you put it on your website? Would you be standing up here talking about it in front of people? And if your honest answer is no to both of these questions, you should never, never, ever take that project. Uh, that's basically the rule I try to follow. OK, number six, communicate more and better. Um, I mean, I personally really struggle with this, too. Uh, I'm OK to be alone for long periods of time and like work completely in my own bubble. I'm not really missing the spontaneous social interactions of an office. Um, so you might think, wow, working remotely must really be perfect for me. Not quite. Because when you have an office, and if you're particularly bad at this, like they, these guys took care of it for me. Quick chats while getting coffee. We had meetings all day. Uh, I basically knew most things about my coworkers and they about me without me actually making an effort at all. So things like this, again, you have to plan for when you're on your own. And if, it feels really weird to plan for social interactions. It's just strange. Um, so for me, that was work that I was bad at. But anyway, so what I did to kind of compensate for this is that I, again, got a little organized and dedicated some time every week to do communication. Uh, for me, it's mostly sending emails or, or Slack or whatever. But if you work at a, with a remote team or something, maybe this is the time where you book all your like one-on-ones or you know, uh, uh, maybe there's a team stand-up thing that you have. And, and just to be sure that it's the same time every week. So everyone knows when it is and no one skips it. Um, and for me, it's Wednesday mornings. And I'm not talk really talking about answering emails. Yeah, I answer my emails regularly, like, you know, but not all communication in, is solicited. Um, so the second one is to like, talk about things that is unrelated to work. And this might also sound silly, but when you're on your own, you really only talk about work with your clients, right? Or the people that you work with, you don't really go out and have a beer with them. Um, and you're really missing out on forming relationships and forming relationships outside of work with work people is probably as important to your career as doing the actual work. So again, sounds silly. I try to send things that the people I work with, I think maybe it's interesting to them. Maybe it's a song that I like, or maybe it's some sort of article about treehouse remote working or, or something, you know? Uh, and this is hard when you don't have the natural everyday relationships. Anyway, you have to think about these things. And the third one is to become a better writer, because a lot of your communication is going to be through email. And you know, misunderstandings, especially when you work with people that are on the other side of the world, you know, can be a lot of misunderstandings. And it could cost a lot of time, potentially a week, right? A week worth of work, that's a lot of budget. And there's a lot of time to miss out on just because you were bad at writing. Like, so be very particular about how you write things. And then if you have a remote team, I mean, there's many ways you can do it, but maybe there's like a, a weekly report that every, work, every team member has to write. And again, it's about like what you did this week, what you're going to do next week. But also, like I was in a crazy boat party last night, and you know, it was really wavy, so a lot of people got sick. Like, just stupid th stuff that, that you know, happened during the week that gives your coworkers a little bit more context about who you are and what you've been up to. OK, two more. Uh, number seven is avoid zero time overlap. I've been working remotely with people in the same building because Google is crazy, and people don't want to go to the you know, meeting room. So just, I've literally been having meetings in, with people in the same building from two like phone booths. Uh, anyway, and with people from all the, uh, the other side of the world. And the time difference really matters, but it's, it's, go, it's both good and bad. Uh, the benefits of being in the same time, same time zone, of course, is that um, you know, you're available when I'm available, and I'm available when you're available. But that could also be bad. Sometimes constrained by time provides a lot of focus, like, especially when you plan for meetings. right? You only have three hours. You only plan for the necessary meetings for those three hours. The only thing here I would avoid is to work on products or have 
remote workers or, or, or clients that are that you, you don't have more, you, you need to have at least, I would say, three hours overlap, maybe two hours, because otherwise it gets really hard and you have to shift your own schedule. And if you're like, if you have a family, that, that's really hard. So about three hours time overlap seems to, be, seems to be right. Anyway, number eight and the last one is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. We tend to think about these things as binary. I'm going freelance or I'm going to work remotely. And it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe you can go down to 50% at your job and then freelance the rest, as a, at least as a start. Or maybe you can work from your home before lunch and then go to the office after lunch. Um, so it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I actually missed uh, working with people a lot. Uh, not so much, you know, like the going out for a beer afterwards and stuff. It's more like working with a team long term with the same goal in mind. And, and sharing that experience, I miss that a lot. So I actually work two days a week now uh, from my co-founder's apartment in Chelsea, New York. Um, and, and it really helps me, at least. To, uh, it really helps me kind of enjoy the moments where I can do this now. <laughs> anyway, I, um, I read this book the other week, and a lot of the stuff that I was going to talk about was in it. Uh, I can recommend reading it if you're interested in this subject. It's more like a nicely written, written medium post, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, um, it's mostly about running a company with remote workers um, and, and a, like a remote team. Um, but I found it really useful, and we use many of the tips in this book to set up processes in my startup. Um, so maybe it would be useful for you too. Anyway, thank you so much, and uh, thanks to the ADDC guys uh, for yet another awesome conference. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, or you can email me here if you just want to hang out or whatever. <laughs> any questions? Going once, twice. There's one. <laughs> where do you get leads, your clients? Sorry, what? Where do you, where do you get leads? Uh, oh, so the clients? question. All right. So the question is, where do I get my clients from? And I get my clients mostly from. Uh, uh, VC companies, so investment companies that invest in startups. Uh, they have a lot of companies they work with, and I'm fortunate enough to be friends with some of the Google Venture people that give me clients. So, but, but really reaching out to them and pitching them about who you are um, can be a really good way to get clients these days, because they have such a large network. Um, of, of, of companies they work with. And also, they keep a list of, of all VC funds, keep a list of contractors that they recommend to their, their, their um, uh, portfolio companies. Uh, also, you probably know a lot of people already that you can reach out to. And, and um, it is hard, uh, but you know, going to places like this, talking to people, it's all about forming relationships, really. I get everything from people that I somehow got to be friends with. Okay, thanks. And uh, do you manage other people's? So do you have team? Sometimes. So the question is if I work with teams. Uh, so sometimes I hire teams uh, if the product is too big for me to do myself, or I have too much and I still think the product would be really cool to do. Um, I sometimes hire people that I, you know, that I think that I like working with. Um, mostly, I sometimes teach a little bit in schools. So that, I mean, I get to know a lot of the students and, and usually try to help them out to get like a better portfolio and stuff like that. So you do work when you want and uh, do not did not set up it it as a um, as a company like an outsource company. Uh, 
development company, something like this. What do you mean? Uh, I mean, you only work as freelancer, uh, but did not make up some outsource uh, company. Yeah, I guess, what is the difference between a freelancer and a studio these days? I don't know. We all have clients. We all have. <laughs> I think the difference is in setup uh, processes, like yeah. uh, input uh, pipeline of clients, and uh, the processing, like uh, management, hiring staff. Mm. Um, yeah. Reserve. So sometimes I do that. Most studios that I know that uh, that are small are about two people, maybe. You know, a lot of them have their own clients. Um, so the difference is very small. But I do work with with teams, and I hire. Uh, other contractors, which also a lot of other agencies and studios do. So it's all really just a scale of you start small and then you grow. If you want to grow, I don't know yet. I pretty like I like being really small and nimble. Um, I don't have a lot of, you know, responsibilities. <laughs> it's kind of nice. Uh, have, have you managed to travel with this uh, remote work? Yeah, yeah, I, I traveled a bunch, um, uh, but. I don't know. It's hard to work and travel. You think it's going to be awesome, but it's, it's also really hard because you feel stressed out. Actually, start to this year, I've started to do that less. And when I travel, I travel. And I, don't, I just say to my clients that I'm not going to work. Um, I find myself less stressed by doing that. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? That was a lot of questions. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? One question. Uh, when you started working uh, remotely, can you have the mic? Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. When you started working remotely, uh, does it make any difference if you, for instance, started working from Stockholm or Malmo, or New York is better so, uh, location for the work that you do? Mm. I think maybe when you start out, it matters a little bit of the people that you have around you, and I think New York is a unique place in the world where there's just so much stuff going on where it might be easier to find work, maybe. But after that, really, it doesn't really matter. Now it doesn't really matter where I'm at. Um, I'm actually moving back to Stockholm in a month. And I told all my uh, clients and everyone that I'm going to do that. And they're like, yeah, cool. <laughs> they didn't care whatsoever. And I find that most like th there's a lot of stigma around like working from wherever. Um, but when it actually comes down to it, people, if they trust you, they trust you. It's more of a trust issue, really. Does that answer a little bit of your question? Okay, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, absolutely okay. okay. <laughs> the other thing uh, that I wanted to mention, uh, Sweden is not so bad in all the sports. In hockey, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. We have one back there. Oh, let me know if we run out of time. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm, I have a basic question. Are you happier now than you were before? Am I happier now than I am before? I would say yes. But happiness is hard. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> happiness you. is not like a constant state for me. I think sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm not. I, I definitely have a lot more time to, to do things that I want to do with my life. I, I, I record music and I have a little music studio and, and like I get more time doing those things. So I've saved a lot of time just like removing my commute, as I said. Like that's that was a huge thing. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks guys.